I'm overjoyed and extremely excited to be able to be here this evening and to be able to speak to you once again. I'm so thankful that I have the opportunity to preach. I love to preach. And I've said many, many times, if it's last minute, someone came down with laryngitis in about three seconds, I would do it. So I'm so excited to preach. I love so much to be able to study and to prepare a lesson. I was more excited about preaching tonight than I was about Christmas the other day. All I could think about was what I want to say in the lesson, what I want to prepare, what, all, what I want to say to help encourage you and to help us all become better Christians. Because it's not about what can I give you, but it's about what can I learn and be able to share from God's Word. It was a few months ago, Cody calls me and he says, hey man, you know what, you're famous on YouTube. And initially the first thing I thought was, oh no, some student has recorded something in class that's out of context. And I'm not worried about what I say in class, but when it's taken out of context, that's a different story. And somebody's put it on YouTube and now there's some ridiculous thing of me on there. So I go type in my name. And I knew as soon as I typed in and I saw a picture of myself standing here, along with Cody, Jerry, HD, several other people. And then I was, whew, okay, nothing embarrassing. Nothing embarrassing at all. So if I noticed it, if somebody calls me and says, hey, go check out this YouTube video. If you know anything about YouTube, it's very, very famous. And people are all the time wanting to watch videos. And I'll say if you're watching this video this evening because you've stumbled upon a search of the Church of Christ or the Portland Church of Christ, I encourage you, don't hit dislike. Don't change to another video. Honestly examine the things that are discussed in the Word of God this evening. You examine for yourself and be an honest judge. And for you, the audience this evening, to examine what the Bible has to say about Lot's wife. You know, something about that video got me excited. It has one like the last time I checked. But maybe I did that. In Luke, in Luke chapter 17, the context of what's going on here is they've come and asked Jesus, what about the, the coming of the kingdom of heaven? And, and as the Pharisees did, sometimes they tried to trick Jesus. When they asked that question, that's the context of, of what's being discussed here. And we're not going to go into depth about this area of Scripture, this passage of Scripture, but he gives an example from the Old Testament of Noah. We know what happened in Noah's day. It was only the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. Literally, it means from the time they woke up in the morning to the time they went to bed at night, it was evil continually. Don't watch Hollywood's version of Noah. Read what the Bible has to say about it. The Bible said Noah preached the word and he prepared an ark and only eight souls were obedient to God's word. Only eight souls entered into that ark and they were saved by water, Peter tells us, inspired of God. Not by an ark, but by the water. So Jesus refers to, no one refers to the time of the people that they were just having a good time and then all of a sudden, as the flood came and Noah and his family were saved in the ark, so shall be the coming of the Son. Then he uses Lot as an example. There they are in Sodom. They're having a good time. We know about the evilness and sin of Sodom. It wasn't restricted to just one sin that we're aware of and the, the issue of, of Lot and his family and the angels that came and visited him. But there was so much evil there and it was destroyed immediately as Lot and his family escaped the city. So Jesus uses those two examples. And he says in verse 32, being an English teacher, it just seems very peculiar that this phrase is here, remember Lot's wife. Notice the grammatical structure, it's not a question mark. He's not asking, hey, you, you remember Lot's wife? He's not trying to make sure he's connected with his audience. He makes a statement, remember Lot's wife. This evening, I want us to look at Genesis chapter 19, beginning in verse 16, and I want us to understand what was Jesus trying to say about Lot's wife? What are we supposed to remember? about Lot's wife. We'll look at Genesis chapter 19 and verse 16. Why is it so important that we remember Lot's wife? Why was it so important in Jesus' day that he told those people in the audience, remember Lot's wife? You know what happened? Uh, that um, Lot was given a choice of the land and he chose the better land. And Abraham said, okay, I'll take the other land. 
And sometimes things look really good on the surface. The grass is greener on the other side, literally. And so Lot chose the land that looked better. But sometimes because something looks good doesn't mean it's good for us inwardly. Sometimes we make decisions on things that look like they're okay, and then later on we have to face the consequences of those decisions, those choices. Lot chose a land that looked good for his herds, but wasn't good spiritually. And so you remember that Abraham pleaded with God, if you can find righteous souls, would you save it? And the number got down and it dwindled lower and lower and lower, and there weren't enough righteous souls in Sodom and Gomorrah for God to spare it from destruction. And so Lot and his family were told, leave the land. And we'll examine those verses in a second. I have five points this evening, five points of things that I believe that we're supposed to remember about Lot's wife. And let's look to see what the Bible says about that. In verse 16, I believe the first thing that we're supposed to remember about Lot's wife is there was a way of escape. There was a way of escape for Lot and his family if they would yet only obey the decree by the angels to escape the city. Look at verse 16. And while he lingered, the men took his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful to him, they brought him out of the city and set him outside. They took his hand, his wife's hand, his daughter's hand, and they led them out of the city. A way of escape was provided. God wasn't going to leave them to just guess, well, what, what do we do? It's, the city is going to be destroyed. What do we do about it? They were led out of the city. Sometimes you and I find ourselves in difficult situations and we think it's just so overbearing. What do I do? How do I handle this? How am I supposed to be able to overcome the temptations and the difficulties in life? And then I think 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Paul reminding those in Corinth, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Those Corinthians, the people in Corinth, had a lot of problems. Had some good things. They're facing a lot of bad things. If God will provide a way of escape for them and that temptation is not so bad that they can't overcome it, you and I can think the same thing when we face difficulties and problems in our life. When we think it's just gotten so bad that we can't handle it anymore, then we think about Lot and his family. They had to leave their city. They had to leave their home. They had to escape. Not only were they facing dangers of men wanting to beat their door down, they had to leave the destruction of hell, fire, and brimstone. We can make an escape. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, Paul also inspired of the Holy Spirit says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give light and the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He's the light and the darkness. He's the path that we should follow. He's our guide. He's our way of escape. If we'll but tune our ears and our hearts to what he has to say, the commandments that he gives us. In John 14 and verse 16, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's so simple. We're being led by the hand of Jesus, figuratively. figuratively. Think about what Jesus had to say or what was said of Jesus in Acts 3 and verse 23. Speaking of the prophet, it said, and It shall be that every soul that will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. If one refuses to hear about Jesus, if one says, I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus, they're turning away from the light. They're turning away from the path of escape from destruction. Or think about what Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24. Therefore I said unto you that you die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If I don't listen to Jesus, of course, I'm not going to believe in him. But if I listen to it and I don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can lead me on the right path, then I'm going to die in my sins. Or Luke 13 and verse 3, Jesus says, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, except you turn your life around, you change your heart and your mind, your attitude, your mindset about life, you'll perish. And he repeats it again because it was so important. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise 
perish. Jesus is the way of escape. Jesus is telling us exactly what we should do to escape. And Jesus also says in Matthew 10 and verse 32, speaking about confessing His name before men. If any man will confess me before men, I'll confess him before my Father which is in heaven. But if any man denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. See, Jesus is providing us a way. He's showing us the path. He's telling us what to do. And in such a simple verse, the words of Jesus in Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Don't turn off the YouTube video. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Jesus says it. If you want to be saved, if you want to be led out of destruction, out of darkness by light, believe, be baptized, wash away your sins. Then in Revelation 2 and verse 10, the words of Jesus there speaking about um, one of the seven churches. He says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll crown thee. Be thou faithful unto death. Literally means be faithful even if it requires your life. And Jesus has provided the way. He's leading us by the hand, figuratively, spiritually. And He's telling us exactly what we have to do and we have to follow. What if Lot had said, no, I, I don't think we're going to go that way. I, I, I know the city better than you and I think I'm going to just do this. Destruction. There's no other answer. Destruction. Scientists have gone to an area that they thought was the area where Sodom and Gomorrah were. They've dug up in the ground. There's nothing left. They can find what they believe to be rock that showed with the fire and brimstone, but there's nothing left. God destroyed it. You think Lot, if he had said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do what y'all say. You think he would have lived? Certainly not. Point number two, remember Lot's wife. Why? In verse 16, because God was merciful to them. God was merciful to them. They'd, they'd done nothing wrong in this instance. It was the wickedness of the cities that God was going to destroy it. That he says, you've got to get out. You've got to go. I'm going to destroy these cities because they're so wicked. And imagine how bad did it have to be that he was going to destroy it with hell, fire, and brimstone. How bad did it have to be that he would destroy the earth with the flood? He had given those people in Noah's day opportunity. No doubt there were opportunities given for these people, but it had come to the point where God says those who are faithful can escape. But don't forget that Lot and his wife left children. They left children. Tried to convince the children, we need to escape, we need to go. Didn't happen. The Lord is merciful to them. He was merciful to Lot and his family because of someone else's sins, not because of their own. In Psalm 103 and verse 8, the psalmist says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. That's true for Lot and his family. It's true for us. It's true for those people in the city at that time. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes, God is a jealous God. God is a God who destroys those who disobey, and He will destroy us in eternal punishment if we disobey. In Psalm 116, verse 5 and 6, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple I was brought low and He saved me. See the attitude of the psalmist? He's merciful, but I lowered myself. God's mercy is there for us, but we must be obedient. Yes, God was merciful to Lot and his family. They had to be obedient. He's merciful to, to us now, those who, who are guilty of sin. Lot and his family were escaping the, the consequences of someone else's sin, but he's merciful even to us now in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 6, 4 through 6. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because of his mercy, we didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it now. Maybe Lot and his family, I, I, I don't know, but God was merciful. And He allowed them to escape. God is merciful to us and is providing everything that we need. He's given us opportunity and opportunity and opportunity and opportunity. 
And how many times have we turned away those opportunities? His mercy should be a motivator for us now. It was as it was a motivator for Paul, and he says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. God's given us mercy. That's motivation. That's motivation for us to get out of the city, so to speak. The third thing we should remember about Lot's wife in verse 17, not only were they led by the hand, not only did God display mercy, but he directed them how to escape. Look at verse 17. They brought them outside, and he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains. They were told exactly what to do. Second Peter 1 and verse 3, As his divine power has given us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. I don't need a creed book. I don't need someone's personal testimony. God's laid it out for us. God's given it to us. Just as they were told exactly what to do, exactly where to go, exactly what not to do, God's done the same for us now. All I have to do is be willing to look at it, be obedient to it. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Paul writes to Timothy and said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished into all good works. I have need of nothing else. It's all right there in God's Word. They didn't need anything else. They were told exactly where to go. Go to the mountain. Don't turn back. They were led by the hand of the angels. We don't need any more. The fourth point Remember Lot's wife? They were warned about remaining. In verse 17, do not look behind nor stay, lest you be destroyed. They're warned. What was going to happen if they did stay? You know, as parents, which many of us are, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, we've dealt with children. Many times children need to hear the end result. If you don't do this, you're going to be fill in the blank. Many times if we don't say that, they, they're, they're forgetful. I was forgetful. My dad had to remind me, hey, if you don't do this, these are the consequences. You and I need that. We need to be reminded constantly, what if I don't remain faithful to God? What if I stray and leave the path? What if I turn away from Him? Remember, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. There's no pleading on the day of judgment. Every knee will bow. There are no excuses on the day of judgment. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 17. And what accord is Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then he says in verse 17, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. We've got to separate ourselves. Lot and his family had to separate themselves from the wickedness. If they didn't, they were going to face destruction. If they didn't do exactly what was told to them, exactly where to go and how to do it, they were going to face destruction. What about us today? We're, we're amongst people that we shouldn't be amongst. We find ourselves caught up in worldly things, silly, petty things that really in the, in the end mean nothing. Sometimes we have to, you know, to, to step back and reevaluate and realize it's not worth it. It's not worth it this evening if you're in sin. It's not worth it whatever is tying you down to this world, to Satan. It's not worth it. It wasn't worth it for them to stay there. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 20, Peter writes, He says, for if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse to them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Speaking about Christians, he says it had been better. It's hard to believe it had been better for someone if they'd never heard the way of truth. 
than to hear it and turn back, to go back? Think about Lot and his family. You know what happened to his wife? She turned back. She turned back and looked at that. She was turned into a pillar of salt. They were warned. They were told what would happen to them. That lingering, that longing for whatever it was, maybe it was the thought of her children that were there. Maybe it's because there was something about that city she just didn't want to give up. Think about that. Remember Jesus said on, on several occasions, speaking about hearing the truth, hearing about Christ, hearing about salvation, and he speaks of people who would turn away. He said it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day. Because if they had heard it, they'd have long repented in sackcloth and ashes. He says that of Tyre and Sidon too. Think about that. What if it said of us? It will be more tolerable for someone else who didn't hear the truth or had opportunity, and yet we turned it away. Yet we turned away from the truth. Yet we got entangled again in the world. And he says, it, it, it's, it's like a dog going back to his vomit. You ever seen that happen before? It's not a pretty sight. Or a sow back to the wallowing in the mire. We really understand that in South Texas with how big the stock show is. You clean that pig up, you want it to look nice and neat. You get ready for the show and that thing turns right back into the mud. It's frustrating. How do you think God feels? How do you think Jesus feels? He, he gave His life for us. And if we turn back into sin... Remember Eve, Genesis 3 and verse 6. She just wanted one little taste. Just one little taste. It looked good. Sounded good. One little taste. And what happened because of that? Or Leviticus 10 and verse 1, Nadab and Abihu. Just one little bit of fire from something God had not authorized. Just one little bit. It was a fire. Their intentions were good, but they got it from the wrong source. They disobeyed God. Just one little thing. Yet it was disobedience to God. Or in Acts 5 and verse 1, what about Ananias and Sapphira? Oh, it was just one little lie. The small things. That may be what's hindering you this evening. The little small things. We can remember. We can remember Lot's wife. We can remember Eve. We can remember Nadab and Abihu. Ananias and Sapphira. We can remember. And while we have opportunity, we can change our lives. And then think about this. Remember those loved ones, or friends who you were very, very close to who passed away. Maybe they were faithful children of God. And this evening, you're not in the right mind, right heart, as maybe that family member was when they were prepared to meet the Lord. You have an opportunity this evening to, to change your life, to do what's right. Or think about those family members, friends, those you were close to who didn't know the way of truth. Remember what opportunities they might have had. Remember that they made that choice. Talked to so many people, their hang-up was, well, what about my mom? What about my grandparents? In a Bible study one time, a girl in tears, well, what about my mother? She, she's not going to accept this. You can't worry about mom. Lot couldn't worry about his wife. He had to continue to go on. He couldn't stop and say, well, my wife, what, what happened? He had to continue to obey God. Our last point. Look at verse 24 through 26. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So we overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Remember Lot's wife, fifth and last point. Because destruction is for sin and forgetful disobedience, not for those who are faithful and obedient to God. A pillar of salt, I don't know why. You know, for the longest time, all I thought was a pile of salt. That's not what it means. A pillar of salt, a statue. When she turned around, she turned to a pillar of salt. I don't think there's a scientific explanation. I think that's a punishment from God. Don't turn back. And when she turned back, she lost her life. There was no second chance. There was no other opportunity to make things right. She disobeyed. Think about this evening, the opportunity that you have. Think, non-Christian. Think if you've heard sermon after sermon after sermon 
You know the way is simple. I laid it out at the beginning of the lesson, exactly what Jesus said. Tonight may be your last opportunity. Tonight you could be baptized in Jesus Christ, put on Christ in baptism, be called a child of God, wash away your sins, walk out the doors of this building this evening right with God. Maybe there's destruction. Maybe Christ comes back this evening. You can walk out those doors this evening right with God. What about you, Christian? What about you're called up in the things of, so to speak, Sodom and Gomorrah? What if you're tied up in those things? Right now is your second chance. Right now is the opportunity given to you to correct whatever it is that's amiss in your life. She didn't have that opportunity. Nadab and Abihu didn't have that opportunity. Ananias and Sapphira didn't have that opportunity. You do. You have the opportunity this evening to escape destruction, to escape destruction, punishment of sin. You know, something that I thought about in reading in Genesis here and reading in Luke, we don't know, a lot. We don't know his wife's name. Many times we'll mention someone's name because it's very important to mention their name, and I'm not questioning God by any means, or Jesus, but it's interesting. Why was her name not mentioned? I know what the Bible says about names. I know what it says about those who are unfaithful, disobedient. On the day of judgment, we stand before God. Those names are in that book, and there'll be some names that are blotted out. Remember what Jesus said and they said, well, we've prophesied in your name. We've, we've cast out demons. We've done many wonderful things. And he says, depart from me for I never knew you. Is your name important tonight? Is your name significant to God? Think about his wife's name. Maybe not even important enough to mention. Maybe the point there is if you disobey, our name is blotted out of the book. And Jesus might say to us, I never knew you. The title of this lesson is Gone But Not Forgotten. She's gone. But Jesus said it. Remember Lot's wife. It's, we're long removed from that time. But I'll say it to you this evening. Remember Lot's wife. Remember the opportunity given to you this evening. We'll sing a song of invitation. We encourage you to come, please. Do what's right before it's everlasting too late. Escape right now while you can. Always stand and sing.